When we gave our gala farewell at the old Metropolitan Opera House last spring, the program began appropriately with the entrance of the guests from Tannhäuser. Our chorus actually seated in the set of the Great Hall of Song. Then our honor guests of the evening, all the former artists of the Metropolitan we could summon, made their entry. When Richard Crooks came on, the tenors of the chorus stood up. And when Alexander Kipnis strode out, the basses, as one man, rose to greet and honor him. How did it feel, Sasha, to get a standing ovation from your colleagues 20 years after you had last sung at the Metropolitan? I was overwhelmed and surprised to see all the former singers, some of them still young and looking forward to the future and living gayfully and joyful in the presence. And I was deeply moved to see this and to be among all those old colleagues of mine. You once began a biographical sketch about yourself with these words. This is a direct quote. I don't know whether you remember or not. You described yourself as an incorrigible dreamer walking through life with closed eyes and heading straight into a danger zone. I was a dreamer and I'm still a dreamer. Without dreaming, we wouldn't be able or have the courage to walk in into this dangerous zone. Young singers don't realize how dangerous this zone can be. But when we are on the stage and taken in by the spirit of this great mission we have to fulfill, then everything is forgotten. Everything is just pleasure. The dream ends only after the performance. It's sometime a very happy and sometime a very sad awakening. And Mr. Kipnis knows whereof he speaks because he's been teaching a great deal since his retirement from actual singing. And he, beginning this year, is on the faculty of the Juilliard School of Music. Let's begin at the beginning, Sasha. You were born in Jitomir in the Ukraine? Yes. It's a beautiful old city about 40 miles away from Kiev. You were a boy soprano? Boy soprano, yes. And I graduated the Warsaw Conservatory not as a singer, but as a conductor. So you might have today been on the podium rather I than might in the studio. Have, yes, I might have today not be a retired singer, but an active conductor. <laughs> they last longer, don't they? Yes, they do. Now, was Berlin the next stop? Berlin was the next stop to study for me, to study. With Grenzebach? Uh, with Grenzebach. I, he was a good teacher. He opened for me many, many sources of good music, which I didn't know. I didn't know Handel, I didn't know Schubert or Mozart or anything at that time. Since Grenzebach introduced you to Handel, why don't we begin today's musical program with a Handel area? We'll be fine. From Berenice? Berenice, yes. Si Trecepi. Mm -hmm. I think you are probably the only singer on record whose debut landed him in an internment camp. 
Will you tell us about that? It was in the beginning of World War I. I was very busy studying my arias, my songs, but I had an obligation to come twice a day to the police station to register. Being an enemy alien, I had to do that. And one day after registering there, the policeman said to me, I have to take you somewhere. He took me down to the uh, prison Alexanderplatz, where they kept me for quite a while. And in my sorrow, not knowing what I'm going to do, how long I'm going to stay, I was trying to memorize, to repeat all the songs which I sang. And I've learned that the guard, the prison of the prison, knew music. And he gave a message to a friend of mine in Berlin that I'm arrested. And if he could help me to get out of, the, of this uh, situation, this friend of mine was a certain Baron von Mutzenbecher, whose brother was the intendant or the general manager in Wiesbaden. And through them, I got out of the prison. Uh, from there, I was signed up to the Hamburg Opera, where I stayed for two years. But before going to Hamburg, I had already a contract to Wiesbaden, to Wiesbaden. For, Wiesbaden for five years. And your debut in Hamburg was Freischütz. Freischütz, right. Shall we hear a bit of the trink lead? With pleasure. One of your roles in Wiesbaden is in, from an opera we don't hear much today. So for the next number, let's hear some of Osmin from Seraglio. Do you want to set the stage for that? The character begins with a lovely aria. He's sitting on the top of a tree and plucking fruits and sings this beautiful tune. As befits a bird, Osmin's aria from the abduction from the Seraglio by Alexander Kipnis. <laughs> Now we come to those great years in Bayreuth. Tell us about those times. After a performance or during a performance of Tristan in Berlin, Siegfried Wagner came backstage and asked me if I would like to sing in Bayreuth the same part. Who wouldn't? Of course I accepted immediately and I came to Bayreuth and I studied Tristan and I studied 
Parsifal. I sang both parts. Parsifal at that time was going to be recorded. These are records of 40 years ago, and I believe they are the first records actually on location. This is Alexander Kipnis in the beginning of the Good Friday music from Wagner's Parsifal, recorded in the Festspiel House at Bayreuth with Siegfried Wagner conducting. Gunnermans in Parsifal was also the role of Alexander Kipnis's debut at the Metropolitan Opera. Now, we are getting a little ahead of our story, Sasha. Uh, you first came to this country with a German opera company in which were Shaw and Edith Fleischer, and the conductors were Mirica and Leo Blech, I believe. Right. And you played the Manhattan Opera House in 34th Street, is that right? That's right, the Manhattan Opera House, and later on we moved to the Lexington Opera House. Your uh, uh, debut was Pogner in Meistersinger, right? Yes, it was the first time and only time when the people started to applaud after Pogner's address. Uh, I was surprised I never had this uh, opportunity, neither in Europe nor here since. but. On the following morning, I had results. And there were two very distinguished guests in the audience that evening. And that evening, yes, there was Mary Garden and Giorgio Polacco and Samuel Insul. And uh, I got an invitation to and a contract to, to the Chicago Civic Opera. At that time, the Chicago Civic Opera was second only, only to the Metropolitan. But since the Metropolitan at that time didn't ask me, I accepted Chicago. That's where I first heard you, and we will have a record from the role from, of that opera, uh, Rosencavalier, the wall scene which ends Act Two of Der Rosencavalier, Alexander Kipnis. Mit mir, mit mir, mit mir, keine Nacht wird so lang. Da später, als auf einmal, dann zum Schluss, sie war so verantwortlich. Red die Abendessen, war sie ein Schreibzeug in mein Zimmer hin, so drüben, dass ich die Antwort dann gib ihm. 
tell us about your discovery of Kirsten Flagstad. Well, I don't know to call it discovery, but I helped her immediately after I heard of her. I was asked if I could replace King Mark and Tristan in Oslo. I agreed, and there I heard a soprano of unusual brilliance, good-looking, not too big and fat. I asked her if she would like to sing in Berlin or in Bayreuth or anywhere else after finding out that she never sang outside the Nordic countries. So I recommended her to Tietjen, who was the intendant of the state opera in Berlin, and he was also the general manager in Bayreuth at that time. After a few days, Tietjen said, your protege is really very, very good. I engaged her for Bayreuth to sing the third norm and to be a substitute for Sieglinde. Did you ever sing uh, Valkyrie with her? Yes, I sang Valkyrie with her in, uh, it was a guest performance from Chicago, from the Chicago cast Chicago. in Milwaukee. Yes. Mm. Well, that brings us to our next record then, uh, that sublime moment where Wotan kisses uh, Brunhilde's godhead from her and puts her to sleep on the Valkyrie rock. Yeah. Alexander Kipnis in the last pages of Wagner's Die Valkyrie. <laughs> Now we come to Boris Gudunov, that testing ground of every bass and a compulsion, I should think, with a Russian bass like Alexander Kipnis. You were allowed to sing in Russian with the rest of the company in Italian. I sang this opera in concert form in German, in Holland, also in Germany. Then I decided it doesn't sound as good, uh, neither dramatically nor musically. And so I restudied the opera in Russian. I sang this opera in many, many countries, and no matter in what language the rest sang, French or German or Italian, I sang it also in Russian. It's very simple because Boris Godunov is a solo part, actually. He sings most of the time monologues, he talks to himself. He has only one dramatic scene with Chuisky, and the scene is so dramatic that doesn't make any difference in what language he sings. On the contrary, I think even the people who don't understand any Russian have more understanding right, by, li by listening the sound than this opera. There is no bad actor or bad singer who can spoil the part of Boris. Boris is a part which carries the singer, not the singer carries the part. It is, I'm sure, a holiday for every singer when he can sing Boris good enough, especially when he can sing it in Russian. So we have the famous clock scene from Act Two of Boris Godunov by Alexander Kipnis and in Russian. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Alexander Kipnis is known as a great leader singer. In fact, Grove's Dictionary, that Bible of musicians, uh, ends its sketch on Alexander Kipnis with these words. Few modern singers, used to the exaggeration proper to opera and to the concealment afforded by an orchestra, achieve his success on a small canvas. So today, we want to close with one of Schubert's most beautiful songs, Haydn Rösslein. Der wilde Knabe brach's Rüßlein, oh, der Heiden. Rüßlein wehrte sich und stach, half ihm doch kein Weh und Bach, musste sieben Leute. Rüßlein, 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 oh, der Heiden. When I hear Alexander Kipnis and his way with one of the great songs of Schubert, of Brahms, of Wolf, I think of what a poet said about the rain pool. The smallest of all bodies of water, yet one that may mirror the sky. 